What if the church is losing influence? Less than 20% of Americans attend church and it will no longer be that we are changing the world. Outside of church walls, there is no hope. For those who say we will bring hope are not living out what they preach. Let them no longer say they came together to make Jesus known. What if we forget this common purpose? The church cannot lay aside our differences and actually serve together. What if we abandon the city? We will refuse to look back and say, what if we did more? What if we could change it? What if we stepped out of denominational lines? What if we were united under one cause? What if we brought the love of Christ to our city? What if we flipped the script and did more? What if we look back and say we will refuse to abandon the city? What if we actually serve together and lay aside our differences? The church cannot forget this common purpose. What if we came together to make Jesus known? Let them no longer say they are not living out what they preach. We will bring hope for those who say there is no hope. Outside of church walls, we are changing the world. It will no longer be that less than 20% of Americans attend church and the church is losing influence. What if? Eight years ago, three churches, Westside Family Church, Cedar Ridge Church, and Heartland Community Church, got together and said, what would happen if three churches started praying together, serving together, and worshiping together? What would happen if we saw each other as teammates rather than competition? And a movement began with those three churches that in the last years has included 50 plus churches from around Kansas City. Yeah, it's been a God thing. These next three weeks, we'll be doing What If the Church. But three years ago, I want to tell you the story of three churches doing it together, Restore Community Church, Olathe Bible, and Westside. And we had such a good time in that exchange those three weeks, we decided to plant a church together. And for the first time in the history of the state of Kansas, three different churches from three different denominational backgrounds planted a single church together, New City Church, led by my buddy Matt Miller over here just about eight miles to the east of us. Matt and his church have been meeting a couple of years, 500 plus people attending there now, been nothing short of a God thing. And here's the good news, they're ready to help plant a church. Is that cool? So, that means we're about to be grandparents. You know how into that I am. And the young man that is going to start New City Church in Edgerton, Kansas, is with us today. I love this guy. I get time with him on a regular basis. You're going to love him as well. Give a West Side welcome to Casey Carter. Hold on, guys. Tear it up, bro. My man. I'll be love, back. Love, love you, bud. Love you, Dan. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sutherland. Thank you guys very much. Thank you, West Side. Good morning. Everybody doing well? Awesome, man. Awesome, man. Great. Thank you guys for welcoming me. Uh, I met a couple of new friends, John and Mark, who said they're going to be my hecklers today. And I appreciate that, fellas. I appreciate that. That's, uh, that's making me feel right at home for sure. So now again, uh, thank you guys for uh, Westside for doing what you've done for us at New City. Uh, you helped birth us. We're your child. Uh, you are our parent, and we thank you very, very much for that. And we hope you have made you uh, very, very proud. Uh, New City has done uh, several things uh, with, with your support, with your prayers, with some of you folks coming and, and helping us, and, and some of you folks coming and having New City uh, be your home. Man, I tell you what, it has been a, a phenomenal 
phenomenal, phenomenal ride in two and a half years. Like, like Pastor Dan said, it's been, we're, we're averaging about 500 people now. Uh, we have baptized in that two and a half years about 140 people. And uh, we're serving the community, serving the, the, the community of Shawnee. We're, we're connected well with the city government, with the schools. Uh, it's just, just a remarkable thing. And this whole concept about what if the church served together uh, is, is radical in our church culture today. We're many times very territorial, aren't we? In our churches, we're not really one of those kind of people that, no, this is the way we do church. We don't really get, want to get involved with those people. And this what if the church, now it up to, what do you say, 50 churches? Man, that's unbelievable. Awesome stuff. Awesome stuff. And we thank you guys very, very much for what you've, what you've done for us. And we hope as, a, as your child in the ministry that we've made you very, very proud. I'm going to pull a Dan Sutherland right now. I'm going to ask you to turn to your neighbor and say, congratulations, you have a grandchild. All right? <laughs> nice. And New City Church, I, I started with New City Church January 1st of this year. I am not a, a typical pastor routine kind of a guy. I'm, I'm, I've never, I didn't grow up in the church, didn't do a lot of those things. So for me to be a full-time pastor, I still, people call me Cat Pastor Case. I go, Oh, yeah, that's me, right. I, I, it's still kind of a weird thing for me, and, and that's not a knock on that. It's just not something I'm, I'm used to. Just call me Casey or dude or whatever. You know, it's just, but I, but I, I just, it's something that's, that's different for me. But when I came on January 1st, uh, we came on with the intention of me being the next campus pastor for New City Church. And we had gone to Edgerton for, you know, in October and November, and we never went down and, and said, gave a sales pitch or tried to convince anyone or anything like that. And we just answered some questions. We prayed like crazy, said, God, if this is what you want us to do, that's what we'll do. And we thought it was a dead deal. We didn't think it was going to happen at all. And so when I came on January 1st, we were looking wherever God said. And about two weeks later, the city of the, the Edgerton Southern Baptist Church called us and said, would you take our church, a completely debt-free church on five acres? Dude, there's like two football fields behind this puppy. Like, are you serious? I'm like, I am like, can't wait to go around door to door. Hey, kids, let's go play football. You know, it's just, it really is remarkable. I can't wait to, to, be, to, to have this property serve the city of Edgerton. We've already just been, seen some amazing things happen in, 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 in the city of Edgerton. My first visit to Edgerton was at a cup above coffee shop, and it's ACA Catering, a cup above. Uh, Josh and Becky C. own, the, they're a mother and, uh, mother and son team. They own a cup above. And I walked in, and you know, the Bible says to go look for people of peace as you go into new cities and that kind of thing. So I was like, God, if there are people of peace, I want to find them. And so the first people I walked in and visited with were, were Josh and Becky, and they were immediately said, man, yes, thank you. We're so glad you're here. We're going to help you. And I'm like, whoa, found them. <laughs> God's good. Amen. And so we were looking at this, and, 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 and they were talking to me about different, you know, different things that they do. I mean, they're highly involved in their church. Um, Becky has now joined New City Church and is going to be helping us plant the New City Church in Edgerton. Hey, man, I mean, I'm wild. I'm, I'm, I'm floored at this point. That night, I get a phone call. And a phone call was from Amy Mahoney, was, who was in the earlier service. And she said, I'm totally freaked out about your conversation and who you met today because I met Becky's husband a year ago and was telling him about, about the discipleship process that we do, about the discipling culture we have at New City. And I, I was explaining to him what we do. And, and he was saying, man, if I could find a church near, nearby like that, I think I'd go, hey, man, there's a church nearby now. Isn't that cool? About two weeks later, I'm uh, taking out a couple that you know, we're having breakfast with, and I, I'm marrying this couple. It's a, we're doing some premarital counseling type of thing. She happened to grow up next door to us. She was a friend of my daughter's, and so to, I'm thinking, gosh, this is so weird anyway that I'm marrying this kid. But anyway, uh, it, you know, so her, her name is Jessica. His name is Blake, and we're, you know, Jessica and Blake, we call them Blessica. That's their couple name. Um, <laughs> So me and Blessica are sitting there at, at IHOP. We were supposed to go to one restaurant. Uh, it was too busy. We went to IHOP and sat down, and I'm telling them, I said, man, there's some crazy stuff that's been happening. 
uh, in our church in the last couple of weeks. We just got deeded or they voted to deed us over a completely debt-free property. And I was telling them about Edgerton, about the fact that the BNSF, BNSF transfer intermodal station, which is like the, the it, it, like all over from all over the country, these, these trains come in and they get, it's, it's, they just get distributed out. To, it's, it's wild. They're expecting about 7,500 jobs minimum to come into town uh, in the city of Edgerton. They're expecting hundreds of homes to be built. And I said, it's just, and they just gave us this church. And I, Blake, who said, uh, he's not from here, he's from California. He said, where is, exactly is Edgerton? That's just about five miles south of, of Gardner. And this lady that's waiting for us, waiting uh, for a, a table as well, pops up and she goes, Abs- actually, the city limits are now together. They're not apart anymore. So C- Gardner and, and, and Edgerton are, the city limits are combined, so they're not five miles apart anymore. I said, oh, are you guys from there? She said, yeah, this is my husband. He's the mayor. <laughs> right? <laughs> Has God got his hand in this, baby? I'm telling you, man. I'm like, What? Are you sorry? I probably look like an idiot going, are you serious, man? That's incredible. He's like, uh, yeah, it's okay, man. Let's see. But, you know, this has gone on and on one thing after another. I even last weekend, we hadn't seen some friends of ours in years. We were at a 50th uh, birthday party, surprise birthday party for a friend of ours. Hadn't seen him in a long time. Used to worship with him, go to church with him, you know, way back in the day. And we're sitting there talking to her. And she says, my grandmother lives in Edgerton. Are you kidding? That's amazing. Where's, where's your church? Comes to find out her church or our church is right next door to her grandmother. <laughs> that, I mean, just one thing after Another, it's been remarkable. And we're already serving in the city of Edgerton, which is, which is such a great thing already that they have, the city has welcomed us incredibly. Uh, we're going door to door right now and not, you know, as the great rapper and uh, as used to say T-Bone, I'm a fan of rap music. I didn't, probably should have told you that ahead. Don't judge though. <laughs> Bible says not to judge. But T-Bone said that I'm not a Jehovah's Witness. I'm a witness for Jehovah. But we're going door to door. And we're not asking people if they, hey, do you know Jesus? Do you know Jesus? Do you know Jesus? We're saying, what do you love about Edgerton? What needs to change? If there's one thing you would like different, what is it? And how can we as New City Church help? How can we serve? And that, I just, and people are overwhelming. As a matter of fact, last a uh, couple weeks ago, we got a couple that was just grilling us about what we believe. Do you believe the Bible is the inerrant word of God? Yeah, yeah. You know, all that. Do you believe that Jesus is the only? Yeah. And they gave us their phone number. We'd like to help you start your church. Wow. Remarkable. I got invited to be on the, what's called the Frontier Days Planning Committee, and it's kind of the event in Edgerton. By the way, the Frontier Days is January, June 20th, 21st, 22nd. Uh, we'd like you guys to, to join us if you would, man. But it's a, it's, it's the, it's a kind of a festival that, that Edgerton has each and every year, and they've asked me to be on, and I've been able to, to serve that way. And we're looking for volunteers. If anybody wants to volunteer, you certainly, certainly can. And uh, we, so we're, we're, we're doing all those things, guys, and it's just truly a, an amazing thing. And I ask for your prayers. I ask for you guys to, to pray. Some of you, uh, you guys know that, we, that you have prayed like crazy for New City in Shawnee, and we ask that you pray for New City in Edgerton. And I specifically, if I may be a little selfish, I, I specifically ask you to pray for my marriage. My marriage is great. Man, I love my wife. She's beautiful. I mean, she, I mean, definitely married up, man. I'm a lucky dude. But there is one thing that Satan will attack when you're going into and you're starting to get momentum and you're starting to get favor and you're starting to see things happen and you're starting to see victories and you're starting to see different things going on in the city that God has called you to be. And he will attack us where we are most, now I wouldn't say vulnerable, but it would crush me for something to happen to my marriage. And I ask that you pray for that. Is that a deal? Can you at least do that? Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. Also, you know, some of you may be called, you know, I want to help this guy. I'm listening to this guy preach. He needs all the help he can get. You know? And maybe I'm going to help this guy and then maybe come to be a, a missionary in Edgerton for six months to a year, whatever it, whatever it takes. And maybe some of you may say, you know what? I live there, near, live near there. Talk to a few people that said, we're, we're, you know, last, in the earlier services that we'd like to help you out and come and be a part of New City in Edgerton. And so everybody can be a part of that. And I thank you for what you've allowed us to do in Shawnee. And I thank you for what you're going to allow us and going to help us with and support us with 
in Edgerton. Luke 10 and, 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 and James 2 talk a great deal about what we're already essentially doing in Edgerton. And these are two great passages that talk about what it means to serve, what it means to, to truly be um, uh, have, a, have a servant attitude and a servant action the way God intends us uh, to be. Uh, in Luke 10 and James 2, like I said, and I love both these passages. They are awesome, man, as far as what it means to serve. But we're talking about, you know, basically we're commanded in these passages to show our faith by our good deeds. Show our faith by our good deeds. We're to love God with everything we have, is what it says here. And to love our neighbors as ourselves and to show that faith and love by serving. So let's get into the scriptures a little bit. Uh, James 2, 8 through 9 and 14 through 19. Now, I love James. I don't know if you guys uh, know this. A lot of you guys do. Some of you guys may not realize that James was the biological half brother of, of Jesus growing up. Uh, you know, so, so as he's growing up, Jesus is the perfect sibling. How many of you had the perfect sibling growing up? Right? Raise your hands. Who had the perfect sibling growing up? Oh, they're sitting next to me. I don't want to do that. But yeah. I had the, you know, some of us had the perfect sibling growing up. Never got in trouble. We always did, right? That's James who got in the cookie jar. Never mind. It wasn't Jesus. James, get in here, right? Right? I mean, it's Mr. Perfect. Thanks, Mr. Perfect. Great. Right? So James didn't come to know Jesus until after the resurrection, which is a powerful, powerful, powerful testimony to the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? And I love what he says here in James 2, verses 8 through 9 and 14 through 19. He says, if you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. Uh, Jesus said that the greatest commandments are to love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength. And the second greatest is like the first, and it is to love your neighbor as yourself. And uh, in essence, you can't truly love God if you don't love your neighbor, and you can't truly love your neighbor if you, if you don't love God. Does that make sense? I mean, this, this, this serving and this love comes out of a, a natural, I don't know, outcome of our love for our, our God. It says, verse 9, but if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. Down to verse 14. What good is it, my brothers, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, uh, keep warm and well fed. In other words, I'm going to pray for you, okay? <laughs> Just keep going. Oh, good luck, right? If we do that, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by actions, is, say this with me, West Side, dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there is one God? Circle this verse. Before I get into this crazy verse, this is almost like he takes a detour in this. But he says, if you believe that there is one God, good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. <laughs> that seems out of place a little bit, doesn't it? But it, 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 if you read the scriptures, understand that every verse in scripture is in context of all the scriptures. They, does that make sense? That we can't just take one scripture out of context and, and find and, and say, and, and some people make life verses out of one verse, out of totally out of context and misunderstood. I've done it myself. And I've preached it myself, and I've been corrected on those kind of things myself. But every verse is in context of all the scriptures. And it says, you believe there's one God. Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. It's not enough just to have a belief about our Lord. It's not enough just to have a belief about God, about the Bible, about salvation, about crucifixion, about resurrection. It's not enough just to have those kinds of things. So I'm a teacher at heart. And I know that you guys didn't know that there was going to be a test this morning, but we're going to have a kind of a pop quiz. It's a yes, no, true, false kind of a test. So you can't get more than a 50 or less than a 50, I should say. I used to love those tests when I was going to school. But, and I want you to, when you answer these questions, you'll probably answer these in the affirmative. Yes, if you are a follower of Christ, you can say no. There's no lying in church. But I want you to do this emphatically and, and somewhat loudly, maybe to the point where 83rd and K7 sort of go to a standstill and say, what the heck just happened, all right? Is that cool? Can we, can we make that deal? 
So I'm going to ask you the first question, and I'm going to ask you this kind of test to, to help us to understand what it means to be a true follower of Jesus and what it means to understand how he served. Do you believe, Westside, that according to Jesus himself in Matthew 20, that he came to serve, not to be served? Yes. Awesome. And he served the sick by healing the sick, by opening the, the ears of the deaf, the, the blind saw, the, the, the lame walk, the dead were raised. Do you believe that he served in that way? Yes. That Jesus was born in Bethlehem, served us, and modeled for us a perfect life, that he died on a cross and rose from the grave. Yes. Do you believe that he is seated at the right hand of God the Father right now and continuing to serve us by interceding for us? Do you believe that, West Side? Do you believe that he loves us and continues to serve us today through his Holy Spirit? Yes. Do you believe that, when, that he has work for his church to do, has service for his church to, to do? Do you believe that, Westside? Yes. Do you believe that when our service is done, when our work is done, that he is going to be coming back for his church? Yes. Do you believe that Satan and his demons know all this too? Then I, I have a question, uh, not, not, a, not an accusation, I'm not pointing a finger, I've had to ask myself this question a lot, I, I'm, I'm not saying uh, anything ac accusatory, if that's a word, I'm, I'm, I'm really asking this question, and I don't want you to answer it out loud yet, but my question is that if you believe that Jesus rose from the grave, died on a cross, fulfilled hundreds of prophecies, impossible for one man, by the way, to do by mere chance, if you believe all that, that he lived a perfect life, that the dead were raised, the blind saw, the deaf heard, the lame walked, if you believe that he, he, he is the, the one and only way to heaven, his shed blood, if you believe all those things, and Satan believes all those things too, and if you believe he's coming back for his church, and Satan believes all that too, my question is, not my accusation, my question is, what's the difference between you, what's the difference between me, What's the difference between us and Satan? What's the difference? I love it. Love it. Guys, we love Jesus. We love God with everything we have, all of our heart and all of our soul and all of our mind and all of our strength. And we love our neighbor as ourselves and we serve our neighbor. Amen? I heard some amens. Amen? This is incredible. Has everybody ever thought about that? The first time I thought about those questions, and what is the difference between me and Satan? It rocked my world because I was a believer in intellect. I believed all these things. How many even people come and walk into our churches today? And I, this doesn't happen here, I know, but there are a lot of churches. This is a chronic problem in our churches today where someone walks in and they, and they say, I believe this and I believe that Jesus rose and I believe that, he, he, that we can only be saved through his shed blood and I, I this. And, and, and even the demons shudder. And they shudder. And we go, man, you, would you like to teach Sunday school? Right? Would you like you maybe make this dude a deacon? Does that make sense? Guys, there's got to be a difference. Our faith without deeds is what? dead. Amen. Luke 10. And I love Luke too because Luke went around and talked to different people about what happened and kind of the interviewer, if you will, has kind of got the information from eyewitnesses for a, uh, you know, he did it for a guy named Theophilus and I just love Luke for that, but there's a lot of detail in Luke. But Luke uh, talks about the parable of the Good Samaritan. And in verse uh, 10, in, in chapter 10, verse 25, uh, he's talking, he's, re, re, he's giving an account of what Jesus was saying to a, a religious guy. And he said in, in verse 25, he said, on one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus, the gall of someone testing the alpha, the omega, the creator of heaven and earth, the, the one who, who gave us life and saves us, tested him. He said, teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus says, what's written in the law? How, he, he replied, how do you read it? And I love that answer. I love that question to, in response to the question. How many times does Jesus ask someone who says, hey, how do I do this? He goes, have you not read? 
That's a pretty powerful question, isn't it? And it's a challenge for all of us. We've got to be in the word. And he answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. He had the answer. He heard the teaching. He knew what to say. But he was justifying, right? And he said he wanted to just, he said, you have answered correctly. Jesus replied, do this and you will, you will live. But he wanted to what? Justify himself. Pastor Dan talked about Peter doing the very same thing with when uh, Jesus was like, hey, you're going to be led and you're going to be, uh, do, basically, you're going to die in a way that you're not going to want to die. And he goes, well, what about him, Lord? He goes, what is that to you? You follow me. So Peter's trying to justify himself. This religious guy is trying to justify himself. So he asked, who is my what? Neighbor. And many times we ask the same question. Well, God, you know, if I knew who my neighbor was, you talk about the neighbor next door, the neighbor down the street, the neighbor in the next town, next county, next state, next country, next hemisphere. I'm confused. I don't know what to do. If we, if, if, how many times do we ask questions like that? And here's what Jesus says in reply. In reply, Jesus says, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest, religious guy, the guy that everybody in town goes, wow, look at that. God's spirit's really on him, isn't he? A priest happens to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, another religious guy, when he came to the place and saw him pass by on the other side, but a Samaritan, someone considered by the Jews a, a half-breed, a, a low-life, a scum, their, their testimony is not even allowed in court. They're not a, allowed to enter the, enter the temple complex. This is, this is, these are people that the Jews genuinely couldn't stand. I mean, it, culturally speaking, you got two religious guys in our church or whatever uh, in, in our church culture today, a, a preacher and a deacon that pass by on the, on the other side, and we may call this Samaritan a, an unbeliever or something like that. It's kind of culturally help us understand. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii. This is not a small sum of money. And gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. If he needs room service, here's my credit card. Right? Circle this question. Love this question, too. Which of these three... He's talking to the religious guy. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? Jesus didn't answer the question. He didn't justify, he didn't help this religious guy justify himself. You know what he did? He says, are you a neighbor? The question is not who is my neighbor. The question that we need to ask ourselves is, am I a neighbor to those in need? Can I get a witness? Does that make sense? Wow, what a radical transformation of how we do this whole walk. It's discipleship. The, the, the very thing, the, the very thing that, that God is, that, that the Lord has asked us to be, to, to, to be and make disciples of Him. Discipleship is never about what the other person has done, it is about what we do. We can't control other people. We can control what we do. And the question must be, am I a neighbor? Not, who's my neighbor? Am I the neighbor? Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell in the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had, you heard the song, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Is that just wreck any, does that, does that wreck anybody else? <laughs> it does me. So how do I learn to serve, guys? How do I learn? To, first off, love Jesus. Love him with everything you got. Love him with your mind, your body, your soul, your spirit, everything. Get into his word. Find out what he says in his word and love him and love him more. And I, some people say, well, how do I understand what that means? Are you talking about phileo, eros, you know, like agape? What are you talking about? All those kinds of things. Guys, all I can tell you is that love is not an emotion. Love is not a feeling. 
Love is a decision that we make. Secondly, love your neighbor. Pastor Dan talked about a couple weeks ago that Christ said when he stated that the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God and everything, that, that the, you can't love God if you're not doing what he says. And finally, be the neighbor that God has called you to be. Be the neighbor. Guys, Dan serves me. Like he said, well, he meets with us about once a month and he serves me and spends time with us. He's a busy guy. And he loves me and serves me and it's humbling. Pastor Matt, who is the lead pastor at New City Church, loves me and serves me and pours into me. Phil Kreiling, who's a guy that meets with pastors all over the city, spends time with me each and every week and serves me. One of our pastors, uh, as you know, I'm a, since I told you already, I'm a fan of rap music. Uh, one of our pastors is uh, Chris Moix. M, his spell his name M-O-I-X. Uh, I call him Mo Nine since that's his. Uh, I call him that. Tell him that's his rap name. He spends. You got some of you. Oh, I got it. <laughs> some of he spends time with me each and every week, and what he's done is he has helped me to go to Edgerton, and with a, with a few remaining folks, and some of them between the '60s and and '70s, uh, with a few remaining folks there, I have have, to, have put together a discipling group and he's shown me how to do that and spends almost an entire day out of his week with me helping me to do that serving me in that way and as a result guys we've seen victory over people that have had decades worth of anger toward a neighbor a years worth of anger toward a family decades worth of of of, of enabling grown children guys this and, and victory is being had already in a few short weeks and at the in, in the in the the core group that we have in Edgerton for our campus there. It's remarkable, absolutely remarkable what's going on. And I can't thank Mo Nine enough. So application time, application time. What is the Lord saying to you? What's he saying? Don't, don't go out of here and, and get busy tomorrow and forget what the Lord is saying to you because what... He is saying to you is as important as what are you going to do about it. If he's telling you, man, you need to serve in this way, uh, what are you going to do about it? What needs to change for you to obey? What needs to change in your life? What habits? How you treat your children? How you treat your family? The things that you do? The things that you spend your money on? The things you watch? The things, your habits? Your hobbies? Whatever it is. What needs to change, if anything, that needs to change for you to obey what the Lord is saying for you to do. And finally, I want you to ask yourself, who do you need to serve and who do you need to serve with? Pastor Dan talked about it even last week then, in the last couple of weeks, that, that there are people that are ahead of you in the ministry, in this, this, this progression of what it means to be a Christian, and they are ahead of you in this walk with the Lord. Learn from them. Find out who they are. And and. There are people that aren't as far advanced as you. And somebody like, oh, there ain't nobody as far. No, there are people that need to know what you know. Learn to help them. Amen, everybody? Amen. Was this helpful to you this morning? Awesome. Father, we thank you so much for today. Man, thank you, Lord, for this beautiful, awesome group of your creation. We thank you for the opportunity to even serve. We thank you for the opportunity to even be a part of what you want us to do. Lord, we thank you. We're humbled by what you have done and what you continue to do. We're humbled by the fact that you continue to serve us. I ask, Father, that you, each and every one of us in here, find out from you how you want us to serve and who you want us to serve with. And everybody in God's house said, amen. amen. Awesome. Love you guys. <laughs> hey, you are. <laughs> nice thank you. You betcha. Casey said that just like I wrote it out for him. <laughs> hey, Casey and his wife, Judy, are going to head out to the uh, bookstore area out here in the commons. If you live in Edgerton, if you live in Garner, live down that way, want to talk to this young man about uh, the church they're going to plant, you can see why I love him. Uh, I met with 22 church planters last week. He's one of the sharpest. And uh, wow, it's going to be fun. To have a grandbaby. I am pumped about that. I really am. Go, God. Here's my blessing to you as we wrap it up today. May Jesus bless you.
as you serve somebody in his name this week. Don't miss next week. God bless your church. See ya.